Thank you. I also want to express a great deal of gratitude and thanks for being invited to come with, uh, I was told I had to bring Natalie, and she said yes, she'll come. So we're very delighted to be here this morning to share worship with you. And when I got here, I wanted to express some concern and ask some questions of Tony about how long I should preach. And even though I was able to shift a good portion of it over to the pastoral prayer, I'm sure as you noticed, I told her that I, uh, it probably will push 55 minutes. Is that okay? <laughs> and um, I, I can tell what kind of leader she is. She said, Dad, don't worry about it. After your first 20 minutes, we just get up and walk out. <laughs> well, in days like ours, it just seems that we cry and cry. It's been said we only feel sorry for ourselves when we suffer misfortunes. The only way to bear the unbearable is to laugh at it. And I'm not up for laughing, but their laughter makes the room feel safer, so we begin to explore. Yes, folks, if we don't laugh, oftentimes we cry. And laughing can help us move forward rather than sink in despair. And that's what I am called to do this morning. Let me, let me tell you a little story. There was this guy sitting at a bar, and since this is a church, um, a bar is a place where you can go. <laughs> There's a note of familiarity out there. And this guy was sitting at the bar just staring at his drink for a half an hour when this big troublemaker steps next to him, grabs his drink and gulps it down in one swig and turns to the little guy with a treacherous stare and says, what you gonna do about it? And the poor guy starts crying. The biker says, or the treacherous guy, in another place, I said biker, because I don't know how many bikers are in here. <laughs> but the mean guy says, come on, man, I was just giving you a hard time. I didn't think you'd cry. I can't stand to see a man crying. And then the little guy says between his sobs, this is the worst day of my life. I can't do anything right. I overslept and was late to an important meeting, so my boss fired me. When I went to the parking lot, I found my car was stolen, and I don't have any insurance. And I left my wallet in the cab I took home. And at home, I found my wife in bed with the gardener, and then the dog bit me. So I came to this bar trying to work up the courage to put an end to my life, and then you show up and drink my lethal poison. <laughs> well, in the parable that Jesus told and we heard read this morning, Jesus identifies the evildoers, the treacherous ones as weeds, and Jesus knew his weeds well. The meaning of Jesus' parable about the wheat and the weeds becomes clearer when we look at the specific kind of weed he talks about. Tares are the weeds mentioned only in Matthew 13. It's a species of ryegrass commonly called, does anyone in here know what it's called? I, told there were, I was told there was some agrarian expertise here in this congregation. This kind of ryegrass is called what? Hmm, okay, you flunk. <laughs> because I was able to look it up, darnel. Anybody familiar with that term, darnel? Okay, I heard a yes out there. Okay, good. You know, it bears the closest, the closest resemblance to wheat until the ear appears and only then the difference can be discovered. 
and it grows plentifully in Syria and Palestine. The problem with taking our hoe to the evil weeds of the world is that good and evil sometimes look so much alike. And oftentimes it's only later when, we become, when it becomes clear that we have weeds on our hands. Only to Jesus is it clear who and what the weeds are. For us, knowing the difference between the weeds and the wheat can be very difficult. And unfortunately, too often we go tearing up wheat as well as weeds. As someone has said, when weeding, the best way to make sure you're removing a weed and not a valuable plant is to pull on it. If it comes out of the ground easily, it's a valuable plant. And there's a corollary to that truth. To distinguish flowers from weeds, pull up everything, and what grows back are weeds. In the parable, the servants are very concerned about the weeds. Will the treacherous weeds choke out the wheat? Will the treacherous weeds usurp the limited water? And the wheat dies of thirst? And the slaves are fearful, and they react in a knee-jerk way without taking consequences in wide wise alternatives into account. And from the first day that we were sentient beings, understanding that we're alive and can think, that's been a human characteristic, to take knee-jerk reaction to things instead of taking consequences and wise alternatives into account. Well, as we very well know, there's treachery all around us these days. A list of treacherous acts over recent days and months would be a very long and detailed list. And without getting too specific, I think the treacherous, the most treacherous of these deeds can be put into one of two groups. One is terrorist acts of different kinds that bring killing and mayhem. And the second group would be the fear-mongering of political and religious leaders that bring confusion that makes everything worse. And the master said, an enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let them both grow until harvest. Let them grow until the harvest. Why are violent and treacherous people, even among us, making the world so dangerous to life and limb? Why are other treacherous people creating such fear and uncertainty by suggesting knee-jerk, barbaric solutions? Why are treacherous people preaching fear and hate for purposes of political and financial gain? Where is all this treachery leading? How are Christians to respond to all this treachery? Be suspicious of those who are different? Live in fear and foolishly respond in fear? Are we willing to inflict pain and hardship on innocent people because we're afraid? Are we willing to surrender our freedoms and democracy to secure our safety and security? Are we trying to pull out the tares too frantically and too early at the expense of the fine wheat of American and Judeo-Christian values? How can we face such treachery and still be content within the love and grace of God? Well, the master said, an enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. As Jesus points to the wheat that grows among the weeds, we can feel the pain and discomfort knowing treachery lives among us. How close, we do not know. How can we find contentment in God in times like these? In our world, treachery grows like weeds, and the world seems to be getting worse and worse. So it seemed to a young woman in one of our public schools was asked to write an essay on evolution. And she wrote this. According to this theory, humans descended from the apes and have been descending ever since. 
And sadly, there's a lot of truth there. Apes are not capable of the extraordinary evil to which humans will resort. Then Jesus says, at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. Yes, let anyone with ears listen. In the end, life will prevail over death. In the end, good will prevail over evil. Through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, we are freed from the power of evil and sin and even death. We are also freed to live the abundant life, to live life with gusto and, yes, contentment, even in the face of treachery. Yes, let anyone with ears listen. In the end, life will prevail over death. In the end, good will prevail over evil. Through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, we are freed from the power of evil and sin and even death. We are freed to live the abundant life, to live life with gusto. And yes, contentment, even in the face of treachery. Through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, the treacherous weeds of the world cannot destroy us. Treachery is powerless over us. As the Apostle Paul assures us, nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even evil and certainly not even death. As an example among many, but certainly one with which I think we can all identify, Martin Luther King Jr. knew this. Back in the 50s and 60s, Martin was able to step forward in the face of horrific terror and treachery to help us in the United States seek justice in the American way of equality and liberty for all people. In spite of the risk of violence and even assassination, Martin was able to declare to a crowd the night before he was shot I have been to the mountaintop. Martin said he was able to see the future of the promised land without weeds. There was strength and contentment in his voice. As we could tell for any one of us who has seen the video While Martin had human failings, as we all do, he was able to live a contented life. How? Through the grace of God, he was a person who was able to trust God. He knew he was in God's hands. With God's gift, gifts of talented leadership, Martin did what he was able to do to be faithful to God. Martin was able to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. In these ways, Martin reflected the life of Jesus. In the face of horrific treachery, Jesus remained faithful to God and did God's will and went to the cross. Jesus was content with his life. For he knew that doing the will of God, his life had wholeness and meaning. He knew that through his death and resurrection, he would rise victorious over evil and death. My friends, through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, God is proven victorious over evil and death. We are in God's hands. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we need not fear evil and death, for we are in God's hands. Whatever happens will be okay, for God is with us.
Last year, Christians in Charleston were in a Bible study when a weed amongst them rose up and shot the pastor and several other members. They rose up from their grief, forgave the murderer, and showed the world how they were in God's hands. They turned quickly to life of love, joy, and hope. They showed the world what contentment in God is like. With true contentment and peace in our hearts, we can face any difficulty, tragedy, or treachery with confidence and hope. That's what the faith is for. There may be tensions and pressures, tragedies and turmoil in our lives. And I know we all experience it in one way or another, sometime or other. And there are tensions, pressures, and turmoils in our lives, but we can rise above them and make good come from bad. My friends, when you get to your wit's end, you will find that God lives there. With the power of God within us, we can face and contend with treachery. We can wage peace and with justice for all. And because of our faithful action, find that sense of contentment that passes all understanding. In this political season, God calls us to be aware of those who advocate tearing out the weeds among us in ways that are not consistent with our faith and America's ideals of justice, equality, freedom, particularly the freedom from fear. With the contented assurance of our victory over evil and death, we can pray the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, love and hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And let there be peace on earth.